Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming this afternoon for our afternoon discussion. Um, my name is Eric Brown. I work here at the Institute. And I'm very happy to introduce our two speakers today, uh, Dr. Hermann Kreutzen, Kreutzen in from uh, the, the Free University of Berlin, who I've just had the pleasure of meeting. He does all sorts of fascinating work on human geography, particularly in Middle Asia. Uh, and I, we really very much look forward to hearing what he has to say. And our other speaker, of course, is uh, Ambassador Hussein Haqqani, my colleague here at the Institute. He's a senior fellow here at Hudson Institute, here at Hudson Institute. Prior to that, he had served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States and has a long and distinguished career as a political advisor and as a journalist uh, and as a colleague of ours. So, um, Our discussion, of course, this afternoon is um, about the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the ongoing construction of the multi-billion dollar China-Pakistan Economic Corridor has been hailed in both Islamabad and Beijing as a strategic game changer and an economic boon for the peoples of Pakistan. Over the last three years, however, the Mammoth Infrastructure Initiative has generated growing criticism inside Pakistan itself for its lack of transparency, the limited inclusion of Pakistani workers and businesses, and its adverse effects on the country's long-term stabilization and sovereignty. Meanwhile, uh, anti-CPEC discontent in the troubled areas of Baluchistan and Gilgit-Baltistan has been harshly suppressed by Pakistani security services. We're here um, today to hear from our speakers about the current situation, uh, in particular in Gilgit-Baltistan and in other parts of Pakistan, and, uh, and then to have uh, uh, an open Q&A with all of you. So thank you all for coming. Uh, Dr. Kreutzmann. Thank you very much. I would just go here, I guess. And can we start the presentation? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation to speak here. And I'm speaking only about a road, a road that is connecting uh, the South Asian road network from the colonial times known as the Grand Trunk Road Network with the Chinese network. And this road, what you see here on this, uh, on on the screen is the major important road that is connecting these two parts of Central Asia and South Asia and was conceived as the Karakoram Highway and is now the backbone of the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. It could be a very simple affair, but this road has so much implications and changed the life of people in, in those areas and it's the only real functioning cross-border uh, cross mountainous road in this that I would love to uh, tell you a little bit about it. It is now at the part of the China Pakistan Economic Corridor. It is involved in this grand project of the new Silk Road or the Belt and Road Initiative or the One Belt and One Road, whatever you uh, want to name it. It is one of the few corridors that is in the north south direction. And in this kind of uh, a new Silk Road scheme, the hub where many things are taking place is Kashka. Kashka is the important old Silk Road town that is very important as a special economic zone on the new Silk Road, the only or first special economic zone in China that is not in the coastal areas that is in Central Asia. And so the Karakoram Highway has been reinvented as part of the uh, CPAC and of the One Belt and One Road project, and uh, I would like to talk about it. Mao Zedong, in one of the few places where Mao Zedong statues are still alive in Kashgar, is looking nowadays at some developments he never would have expected, I think, in his lifetime, that international trade fairs take place between South and Central Asia, and investors are coming to this area, and huge sums are discussed what could be done in those areas about it. We see here something in development one has to contemplate that it is a long development. Forty years ago in this year the Karakoram Highway was opened after it was constructed for 12 years uh, as a Chinese gift for Pakistan basically. But this road has been rebuilt three times since and there are very few mountain areas even in Switzerland that can afford 
uh, to build such expensive road systems several times. In 1986, this became an uh, as asphalted road in the Chinese road system. By 2008, the road has been rebuilt another time. And what you see here on the picture is a highway of an investment size that it would be a highway in the Swiss or Austrian Alps as well, and is something very special. There must be a, the question, who will pay for this investment? Who will benefit from this investment? And why, after such a short time, a new road again that has been constructed here? For the people of Gilgit Baldistan, this is the question whether this is a game changer in their lives, in their economies, in their participation in this. And there are so many questions connected uh, with this investment here. And uh, there is a new gateway to China on the Kundra Pass. It's a new gate that is recently constructed uh, over there. And uh, it is all labeled now as a China-Pakistan economic corridor. But most of these developments have a longer history and uh, that has to be kept in mind. So it comes as a visible sign as an infrastructure project. An infrastructure project in road building, in link road building, in hydroelectrical power plants, in some mineral exploitation. So it looks as a very economic affair in the beginning. But there is a long-term plan. The long-term plan, which was disclosed last year by the Pakistan newspaper Dawn, uh, it's going up to 2030, and the expectations are very high in Pakistan. The expectations are that the economic crisis will be overcome in Pakistan, that the economic benefits would be great. From the Chinese side, the expectation is very high because the Pakistan market of 200 million people is much bigger than the Central Asian market of consumers uh, that is involved in the, in the Silk Road project. So there are... The pros and cons in, in, in this respect, and uh, the boost of infrastructure is only one aspect of it, but the expectation as well that we have a rural uplift in the country, but on the other hand, the question again is who is paying for it, uh, what will be the market shares for the Pakistani goods in this, is China dominating the economy of Pakistan afterwards, and uh, how will this all be recovered? The plan which was disclosed last year had this wonderful map there, which has the wonderful Chinese headline, one belt, three passages, and two axes, and five functional zones. That is, uh, uh, has to be explained. It is one belt that is connecting China and Pakistan, Karachi and Kashgar. It, is, uh, it has two axes, that is the axis through the mainland of Pakistan, through Punjab, and the Balochistan axis. Uh, it has five functional zones along the area, and the functional zones that are important for us are not Kashgar, not the Punjab, and Sindh. These are the economic heavyweights in this part. The two functional zones that are important for us are Gilgit Baltistan and Baluchistan. And Gilgit Baltistan and Baluchistan were attributed the same kind of description in this uh, program. It's a border logistical channel. That means a thoroughfare and nothing more than that. It is for resource exploration. That is, minerals are important that are to be exploited in those areas. And it's for ecological conservation. That is the soft aspect of these kind of uh, programs. This is combining transboundary national parks and, and making nature preserves and, and so on there. So that is what is happening here. On the other hand, people are asking, more and more the question, what will, who will, how will Pakistan pay for this? Alone this year, Pakistan up to May had taken $5 billion of loans from China at conditions that are not as favorable as in other contexts in, in the world. Some IMF representatives told me that they would have got better conditions there than on the, on the Chinese side. So these high investments in CPEC, they afford a huge cost to the area. And uh, probably in this year, we will experience another bailout uh, application of Pakistan with the IMF after 2013, another one. And the rupee is devaluated as well. So there is a short-term effect of this, and there will be long-term effects. The long-term effects are very much on the expectation side, while the short-term effects are on the financial side uh, quite a bit. The long-term expectation to this 
project is as well that the Chinese railway system will be connected with the Pakistan railway system. But that is really the long term and postponed. That is not what we should deal with at the moment. This was the initial idea to make a railway from Kashka, which was connected to the Chinese system in the year 2000 with the Pakistan system, but it has not been expanded southwards. It has been expanded only on the, along the southern Silk Road to Yarkand and Khotan and, and, and those places in Xinjiang, but not to Pakistan yet. What is happening now is $2 billion of ex investment into the completion of the Karakoram Highway, that it will become a highway where big container trucks can ply. And that is something what Pakistan is facing at the moment. That is the, what I would call Karakoram 4.0, the fourth time that Karakoram Highway has been built there. A number of link roads that are connected in Pakistan that certain valleys can be reached. And a special economic zone is the plan. And the special economic zone is in Makpundas in, in the southern part of Gilgit Baltistan near the Skadu Road takeoff. And there you can see what is the portfolio. It's marble, uh, granite, uh, iron ore, it's fruit processing, steel industry, mineral processing, leather industry, so local products from agriculture and from the mineral exploitation. But in this place of Makpundas, there is no electricity yet. So a 100 megawatt hydroelectric power plant is, is planned there. So we can see this will not function in the next five or 10 years properly because all the preconditions are not given there. In the end, it's in the first place, it is the road that is the effect of this kind of cooperation at the moment. So for the people in, in Gilgit, Pakistan, the question is, is this a game changer or, or uh, what, what will be their role in, the, in this whole affair? The soft part is that the Kundrat National Park, the Central Karakoram National Park, are connected with the Tashkogan Mayus uh, Reserve. That is very good for Marco Polo sheep and snow leopards, probably, but has not that much effect on the daily uh, life of people in the area. But that has been achieved so far. Much more severe are the challenges in the area. Much more severe are the challenges in the area that this is an area which is not covered by the constitution of Pakistan as other parts of Pakistan are covered there. The people are disenfranchised from national uh, elections. Uh, that is an undefined administrative status in the area. The territorial dispute, the part of being, uh, of being part of the Kashmir conflict is very important in, in this area. The geopolitical impact is quite important in, in this part. And we have a situation where people play a role and people have a variety of different ethnicities, languages, religious affiliations that are different from the rest of Pakistan. So we have here a minority situation that is now overloaded with the CPEC situation and people have certain reservations. I will give you some uh, background to what is the situation. You see here the, the red line of the CPEC going through an area called Gilgit Baltistan. When you look on an Indian atlas, this part is part of India. It's not part of Pakistan. And all what you see in a beige color here is claimed by India. Gilgit Baltistan, Aksai Chin, which is occupied by China at the moment, uh, that those are claimed by India. All what you see is green Jammu and Kashmir, which is basically the administ Indian administrative part of Kashmir, is claimed by Pakistan, or, or at least a referendum is demanded for this. And Azad Kashmir, the free Kashmir, is a very small part of Kashmir that is administrated by Pakistan. So we are here in a, in a situation where each and every spatial entity has a different political status. And the southern part of the CPEC on the way to uh, Islamabad is going through the so-called provincially administrated tribal areas. They have, again, another political status there. So it's a very complex situation of different kinds, forms of administration and laws and people's participation in anything there. This January, the uh, cabinet in, in Islamabad was discussing whether this should be changed whether the constitutional change, uh, status should be changed. The people of Gilgit Baltistan, they are demanding basically since 1948 uh, that they would be at par with the r uh, rest of the society, but they were 
excluded from getting the same kind of administrative status. And this year, uh, I, this is a quote from the cabinet decision. However, it was decided that owing to the diplomatic obligations and in the national interests of the country, issues of constitutional status and representation in the parliament would be considered subsequently. So there was another postponement of this. People were aspiring for, for getting this status and fighting on, and demanding this status, but it did not happen there. What is the situation in Gilgit Baldistan? In Gilgit Baldistan, I did a survey many years ago about the language situation. We have 20 different languages that are spoken here that belong to Tibetan language group, to the Iranian language group, to the Turkish language group, to Indian languages, and an isolated language, the Burushaski, that has no neighbor at all. In the census of Pakistan, when the language was registered there, the table says, in Gilgit Baltistan, 2% of the people speak national languages, 98% speak others. And it's not further qualified in, in the status. So we have a complete reverse of the situation of Pakistan in the linguistic field here. The same, similar situation in the religious affiliation of people, the denominations are just the reverse of the rest of Pakistan, where you have 80% of the population of Sunni belief and 20% and probably uh, of Shia uh, affiliations. Here we have three Shia groups, the Twelver Shia, the Ismailia, and the Nurbak Shia, who form the majority of the people there, and Sunnis are in minority. Only the closer you go to the Afghan border, the Sunni groups are more than others there in Chitral. But at the same time, we are not here in an area which is so excluded from everything else from the mainstream. We have a very strange and interesting situation in the educational level, in educational attainment here. In the Hunza and Giza area, we have the highest education of females and males in all over Pakistan. Nearly 100% of all boys and girls go to school here. This you find not in the mountain areas of other parts. But at the same time, in Gilgit Baltistan, we have area, areas where only 10% go to school and so on. There's quite a stratification, and that has something to do with the religious affiliation and the social organizations that are connected there. And it's basically connected to the Aga Khan institutions that have built schools for girls and boys there in the remote uh, villages over there. And these people who live there are not without political interest. They are in the regional elections, in the last regional elections, you could see these down with the USA, Palestine is our mission, and you could see the different parties from down country Pakistan represented here as well. But you could see a demonstration on the bottom left, you see the picture of Baba Jan. He, he is a populist representative of, from the Hunza Valley who is sitting in jail for an alleged crime he could not have uh, 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 performed because he was not there at that place when it took place. But he is in jail for the next uh, what, 20 years or so, or so. But he has a very strong followership there. So, And we have the Islamic parties. The MMA is very strong there as well. So we have a spectrum of the whole society of, of rest of Pakistan when it comes to politics uh, here as well which is seen from outside as a destabilizing factor somehow. That's why China has uh, implemented certain security measures. The, the prime interest of that relation to maintain the China-Pakistan economic corridor is called stability. How to achieve stability? On the Chinese side in Xinjiang, you probably are aware what is going on there. and. Uh, that there's the fighting against the so-called three evils. The three evils are called terrorism, extremism, and separatism. In China, this is addressed towards the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Here, it is addressed against the Islamists from Pakistan. And I think the mural painting, which I photographed in Xinjiang two years ago, shows you that there is a green snake that is killed and that there is a Pakistani flag. So it's quite obvious who is the enemy in, in this respect, uh, uh, who might infiltrate into, into Xinjiang at that time. So the Chinese government has introduced a yak cavalry, 
that is uh, f uh, in the mountains controlling the, the boundary. And these are the pictures they have posted themselves in the internet of their performance on the high levels above 4,500 meters in the border areas that they will curb infiltration uh, at all. On the other hand, the economic partnership is celebrated. Long live Pakistan-China friendship. The uh, m most modern facilities have been established in the border areas for the customs and, and immigration facilities there. It's called a Kunjara port, although it is on a pass in the mountain areas. That is the, the, the border station uh, to Pakistan. On the Pakistan side, uh, the security force are very happy, happy to have allegedly the highest ATM uh, in the world on the Kundra Pass, and it's a tourist attraction to go there. But the border is very uh, heavily controlled in, in those parts as well. Pakistan media have responded in that way to see this, this asymmetric relationship between Pakistan and China in a way as if Xi Jinping, who has just become an eternal leader of China, uh, so to speak, uh, without, without time limit, and Nawaz Sharif, who is shown here as his uh, suckling, so to speak, who is sitting at the moment in jail with his daughter, uh, that this is the, the representation of this uneven relationship between the two sides in the cooperation of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So the question is, who benefits from this uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor? In the former times, the Customs clearance in Pakistan was within Gilgit Baltistan. It was a shared kind of joint venture product between China and uh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan. And certain proceeds of this uh, dry port in Sost that was going to the people in the area and they had their shares in it. Now, this has been taken over by the National Logistics Cell, an Islamabad based uh, institution. And uh, so this has been excluded. This is the place where Chinese goods are reloaded from Chinese trucks into, onto Pakistani trucks. It looks like a desert uh, settlement there in Sost, but that is the place where all this is taking place. But the plan is to, put, to, to shift this uh, place outside of Gilgit Baltistan uh, into KPK, and that we have a different situation there. Last year when I was there, it was that the digital connection between China and, and Pakistan was established. That was the, the glass fiber uh, cable was laid down. And at that time, there was a discussion coming up in, this, in the social media, in the printed media as well. What will come out from all these activities that are visible for the people here for their benefit? How can they participate? The people were fearing exclusion and deprivation that would be the outcome of it. And as you see it now a long list, you don't have to read the list, but they made interviews uh, with several thousand people and were asking, what are you expecting from the outcome of this China-Pakistan economic corridor as benefit for the people of Gilgit Baldistan? I skipped this list. I have only highlighted some of these aspects that were mentioned there, and they were fearing to be excluded and that community ownership would be given up, that local labor would not be employed, that proper political representation would never come. And they were quite right, because in June of this year, a new governance order was issued for Gilgit Baltistan in 2018, June. And this governance order has changed the Gilgit Baltistan Legislative Assembly in the Gilgit Baltistan Assembly. They have reduced the legislation capacity of the parliament, of the regional parliament, which was a little bit close to provincial status. They have reduced it. They have abolished the, uh, the Gilgit Baltistan Council, which was the sec second chamber of the regional parliament, and have put the prime minister in charge for it. The prime minister can, can act in everything, and the prime minister can retrieve and uh, squash every legislation that is taking place in the area. So the other quest, uh, aspects the people were demanding is economic development, that they participate. Many people fear that they're expropriated from their landed property in the area. In Gilgit Baltistan, there's a traditional law that land cannot be sold to outsiders. 
that land should, has to be offered to people from the community. But now with all these mineral prospects, uh, prospectation and, and, and the interest in mineral exploitation, there are certain moves of very pot potent investors going on that try to convince people to sell land to them, and that has happened already. And so that is kind of expropriation of the proceeds from, from this as well. And uh, overall, we could say they are afraid that they're completely excluded from any decision making and any profits from what on benefits that the um, China-Pakistan economic corridor might bring. I show you the, I'm coming now to the end, I'm showing you the monument commemorating the first Karakoram highway from 1978. That highway was built as well on a loan basis. But two, three years later, China canceled all loans, and it was a gift for Pakistan. We are pretty sure now that this will not happen with the new Karakoram Highway, with the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Pakistan will be adapted for a long time. So during the last election, it was very diverse to which party people should uh, orient themselves. Normally, the uh, the chief ministers of Gilgit Baltistan are always with the ruling party in Islamabad. So we had a uh, Pakistan Muslim League government of the Nawaz uh, family support. And, but now we have a new prime minister in Islamabad, Imran Khan from, of PTI. So it is not clear what will come out for this for, for uh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan. But he is the person in charge. He is now. Uh, with the new governance order of 2018. He is the all-out person who can make decisions here. And I show you these pictures from uh, Pakistan newspaper Dawn. Recently was an article whether Imran Khan is an extremist, and there were completely two completely differ different opinions about this, and it's very hard to calculate uh, what will come out of this, and that's why uh, there are many questions connected, what will be the future and the outcome for the people in Gilgit Baltistan and how they might benefit. Thank you very much for listening. Hussain. Let me begin by saying thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, quite comprehensive. Uh, so I will just first lay out the uh, official Pakistani perspective, uh, which is shared by generally also a vast segment of the Pakistani media, the Pakistani political class. Uh, and probably Pakistani society. Uh, going back to the 1965 India-Pakistan war, Pakistanis have tended to look upon China as a more reliable ally than any other ally they have in the world. Uh, the phrase used is that, uh, the, uh, that the US uh, is a um, fair weather friend, and China is an all weather friend. Uh, of course, we will come to that when I start giving my own opinions, but right now we are just talking about the widespread perception. Um, and that perception essentially is based on a shared rivalry or uh, negative view of India. And I think that is something that is widely acknowledged in Pakistan. Why would China uh, always want to support Pakistan? It's not because there are shared values. It's not because there is a shared language. It's not because there's a shared religion uh, or there is a shared culture. It's a shared geopolitical interest going back to 1965. However, uh, China's promises of support uh, have been much more careful in the past. Uh, so in 1971, when Pakistan was at war with India over Bangladesh, Pakistan expected that China may actually create uh, enough of a military pressure for India uh, on its border with India so that Pakistan's troops in East Pakistan could find some relief. Uh, it is ironic that the last cable from general headquarters to the Eastern Command in Dhaka, which is recorded in several books, including the book by General Niazi, who was the commander there, said that white from the south and yellow from the north, which I think was a very uh, sort of weak kind of code, uh, expected to intervene, so hold on. Uh, of course, neither happened. 
The Americans did not intervene from the south by sea, which was expected, and China didn't intervene from the north. So, so China did not really prove to be the all-weather friend Pakistanis were expecting it to be in 1971, but the perception remains that it, China is there for us. And China has been supportive in terms of military terms, and, and, and it has never lectured Pakistan or told Pakistan what to do publicly, which Americans are accused of doing. So this is a Pakistani perspective, widespread. CPEC is seen as a, an economic lifeline for Pakistan. Again, at a time when the United States is pulling away from Pakistan, United States is making a long-term a long-term partnership with India, a strategic partnership. Uh, President Obama uh, called it the partnership of the 21st century. If Pakistan's concerns are going to be India-centric and India-focused, then quite clearly it has to identify with the great emerging power that shares its view of India, or as Pakistanis see it. It's another matter that India's trade with China is five times larger than Pakistan's trade with China. Um, Pakistan also thinks that it is an integral part of the, uh, of the Silk Road. That's a general Pakistani perception, historic Silk Road. Well, the Silk Road ran east-west. And so if there was any connectivity with Pakistan, that was just through this small sliver that uh, 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 was referred to as Gilgit Baltistan uh, and, and the disputed state of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, Pakistan would have to borrow for large-scale economic infrastructure anyway. So since China is providing the loans, why should Pakistan feel any objection? Yes, they might be a little more expensive, and China has changed. China is not Mao's China that forgave the debt for the Karakoram Highway. It will probably extract the debt uh, as it is doing with other countries. It is now more a capitalist country uh, with a, a, a capitalist country run by a communist party. Uh, but, uh, but Pakistan would have to do that. So this fear of debt is unfounded is the Pakistani view, general view. And the government also holds that view. Um, the northern areas through which it, which actually connect Pakistan to China, again, that connectivity is important to Pakistan, both for economic and strategic reasons. More strategic, perhaps, than economic. Uh, the, now, the northern areas are an integral part of the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir, which Pakistan's legal position is that we dispute its accession to India. And since we dispute the accession to India, therefore any part of that state is only temporarily part of either country. So the part of Jammu and Kashmir that is controlled by India is only temporarily controlled by India, and the part that is controlled by Pakistan is temporarily controlled by Pakistan until the future of that state is decided in accordance with the United Nations resolutions. Uh, creating this connectivity with China has three implications in, in official Pakistani perspective. One, it, pre, it creates a faith accompli with at least one part of the erstwhile state, which Pakistan assumes once there is a referendum, if there is a referendum uh, or a plebiscite, it would result in favor of Pakistan. But even if it doesn't, Supposing the Kashmiris on the Indian side end up voting either for India or if the third option is offered to them and say, we want to be independent, there will be a faith accompli here because China will have already built this corridor and linked Pakistan to it. And so therefore, that would be a very different thing. Um, any resistance to CPEC is essentially seen in Pakistan as externally supported, which basically means it's America that supports resistance and anger and criticism of CPEC. And the Americans do that because they don't want Pakistan to fall out of America's sphere of influence into China's. And the Indians do it because the Indians always do many things that are contrary to Pakistan's interest in the general Pakistani uh, uh, conception. The CPEC is, is expected to, gener to pay for itself, number one. And number two, to generate economic activity sufficiently for Pakistan to actually become uh, economical, uh, economically far more uh, sort of growth-oriented than it has been so far. The assumption is 
that the roads and connectivity will enable Pakistan to produce more goods, export more, primarily to China. Pakistan will end up having a road access to a market of 1 billion because Pakistan does not want at this point to engage in that relationship with India, which is also a market of 1 billion, but China is the market. And then China's advantage would be that it would be able to sell its higher end goods to Pakistan. The port of Gawadar uh, on the uh, Makran coast is expected to become a major port for Pakistan, an alternative to the uh, port of Karachi, which is particularly clogged, and also whose hinterland is the city of Karachi with its many, many problems. Uh, so this will provide a cleaner, nicer, easier access. And lastly, it would open Pakistan to trade with Central Asia and make Pakistan the hub of trade between South Asia, Central Asia, and the Middle East via Iran. So that's the way that it, CPEC is seen in Pakistan, at least presented through official quarters. There is often uh, an attempt by official uh, uh, sort of circles to try and actually make sure that discussion of CPEC is within these parameters that I just laid out. Now, what are the criticisms and objections, especially of Pakistani civil society? Uh, the Pakistani civil society feels that in the process of these uh, agreements for CPEC, Pakistan has kind of de facto uh, granted China extra ter territoriality. Chinese bring their own engineers, they bring their own labor, they have virtual control over uh, all aspects of the CPEC projects, and Pakistan has to provide security for the Chinese, and that's the arrangement. Uh, there are those, including myself, who have criticized CPEC for one very simple reason. My criti criticism is that Pakistan spent the first 65 years of its life ending up creating dependence on the United States. And now Pakistan is ending up creating dependence on China. So if Pakistan has to be truly independent, it has to figure out what its limits are, what its capabilities are, how much does it want to confront anybody in the world, and what its ability to produce is. For example, today, Pakistan's exports are about $22 billion. It's important to see what we export. Do we export anything that the Chinese would want? If the products that are made in Pakistan are the same products that are already being made in China at, che at cheaper prices and much larger quantity, what will we sell them? Or will we end up being just another sort of Chinese backyard that will export raw cotton to China for Chinese mills, which will then produce the cheaper quality cloth and then the garments that would end up being marketed elsewhere in the world. So this aspect of dependence is definitely one of the things people who criticize and are in opposition to the state narrative, they point out. Um, human rights violations is another. And the, of course, there's the simplified version, which is that, for example, the people of Gilgit Baltistan are being deprived of their potential for being able to have an, an, a, a, an autonomous legislative body uh, or pursue the, uh, pursue the right to have a province, that, they are actually, that, that those rights are being rolled back. Uh, Baluchistan also, the people's demands for uh, um, autonomy uh, are being crushed. Uh, that's, that's the criticism. Uh, but there's another dimension to it, which is that China's attempts to cinify its westernmost regions, especially Xinjiang, those ideas may end up or are, being, are already being imported into Pakistan. So what has China done in Xinjiang? China has declared Islam illegal, only country in the world to do that, formally illegal in Xinjiang. 10% uh, of the Uyghur population is in prisons. And Pakistan, which since the days of, since its independence, when Pakistan first voted against the UN resolution for the partition of Palestine, and Pakistan said, we will stand up for Muslims everywhere in the world, and then Pakistan did. It st stood for Eritrean Muslims, and it supported the independence of Algeria, and it supported the independence of Tunisia, and it then has st stood for the Palestinians consistently, and uh, um, Moro Muslims in Philippines, and the Burmese Rohingya. 
the one community of Muslims Pakistan does not like to talk about at all is the Uyghurs in China because China is so strategically important. But the downside to it is that when you don't speak about what is happening to the Uyghurs of China or the Muslims of China, then you are implicitly saying that those kind of things to assimilate and build a nation are okay. And that sort of is a slow process inside Pakistan, which especially those who feel that, you know, there may be attempts to, to, to merge uh, the relatively smaller minorities as well as communities that are not necessarily part of the mainstream, that bringing them into mainstream through a Chinese strategy rather than the old Pakistani strategy, which was more Western-oriented of kind of talk to everybody, give them a seat in parliament, bring them in, et cetera, et cetera, that it might actually move in that direction because of China's influence. Because when the, and if Pakistan doesn't have to answer to American human rights uh, uh, criticism anymore, then it's more free to do what the Chinese do, and therefore that might start happening in Pakistan. And that's a criticism that some of the human rights organizations in Pakistan have made of all of this. Um, uh, then, uh, the, then the problem of being indebted, pure economic factor. Uh, there is very little transparency with CPEC loans. Like, unlike an IMF loan or a World Bank loan, which you can go online, even this evening after this meeting, you can go and find the terms of every loan that the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, or the IMF has given Pakistan. You can find those terms. Uh, you cannot find those terms for the, for the CPEC loans. So is Pakistan ending up signing up to things? And then there's another thing. We had the picture of Mr. Nawaz Sharif, who was in prison. But his government, he was the prime minister when a lot of these deals were signed. Uh, China is rated as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And so has there been private corruption in all of this process? For example, are there loans that are much more expensive and put on the state for the simple reason that the intermediaries on the Pakistani side were economically, personally benefiting from it. That's another criticism, another cr critique, and a question that remains unanswered. People don't really know uh, whether there is an answer to that. Problem is, when you link economic decisions to strategic decisions, then letting the economic logic prevail is not easy. So yesterday I was asked by a journalist that Prime Minister Mahathir Mohammed has cancelled uh, some of the Chinese loans because of the terms. And again, there was also a problem. Their Prime Minister is also facing, the former Prime Minister is facing criminal charges, and it is said that he may have economically benefited personally, and uh, some of his cronies may have benefited from some of those Chinese uh, uh, loan deals and, and, and investment deals. But M Malaysia could afford to do that. Because Malaysia doesn't have a strategic relationship with China. It only has an economic relationship with China. So in an economic relationship, you can turn around and say, thank you very much. We are canceling this loan. We'll pay you the fine that we are required to pay according to the agreement. But we just can't afford it, which is exactly the language Prime Minister Mahathir Mohammed used. How do you do it when your relationship is more than just economic? Economic is just one piece. You are actually building a strategic partnership primarily for your security and for your long-term viability as a nation state. And that, I think, is going to be the real crisis for Pakistan in relation to CPEC. What happens? So basically, CPEC is, uh, in, in case of CPEC, Pakistan has entered a room where there is no exit because exiting from the economic uh, deals if it transpires that usually in business and everything you know you, you, you look for the lowest loan and so if loans are available from uh, World Bank, IMF, ADB, etc. at 2, 2.5% you take those you don't go for 6% loans from China you're locked in with 6% loans even if you are able to get 2% loans now you can't do that because that will jeopardize your strategic partnership which is far bigger far more important for Pakistan than just the economic dimension of it. So the loans, it will get saddled with, and it will not be able to exit because of the strategic dimension. Those, I think, are both, and I think I, I have been 
uh, reasonably fair in listing both the official uh, sort of uh, want for want of a better word spiel for 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 CPEC and the criticism that has come from some of the uh, major Pakistani um, sort of critics of the projects. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you um, for two really uh, comprehensive presentations. Uh, let's, we have about 15 minutes, so let's open it up for, for qu questions and answers. Sir, if, um, we'll have some microphones coming around, and if you can very quickly introduce yourself. And, and uh, I'm Joel Coulter, independent consultant, but I worked on a Pakistan, uh, Pakistani airport project involving Imran Khan and some other people years ago. And it was a US funded project and kind of all of a sudden went over to China. And my question, since we have so much data about how China could involve in more of a bottom up versus top down strategy from a strategic perspective, but don't seem to do so. Talking about your long term sustainability and viability, if China's not willing to invest in the local regions to build up their capacity, then really is there a long-term strategic relationship that really benefits Pakistan? Well, uh, my own view would be that this is one of those many things that I disagree with most of my countrymen with. And I mean, I get right royally abused for it, although it's just a difference of opinion. They should think about what I say. But my argument is that China uh, has not invested in productive projects yet, like productive as in something to produce, to export right away, industrial unit, etc. So they're, pro they're investing in infrastructure. Now, infrastructure is useful only when it is used to generate economic activity. So a road, for example, is useful as much as it is used. Okay, But the roads are used by people who are going along, uh, sort of moving goods and services, mostly. And then people, OK, so tourism, etc. I don't see an influx of Uyghur tourists into Pakistan through this road. Uh, and I don't see many Chinese coming and visiting, you know, oh, God, let's do our summer holiday in the city of Karachi. Let's get on a bus from Beijing, and we'll go all the way to Karachi. I don't see that happening. I don't see people in Shanghai waking up and saying, you know what, I'm applying this. For example, right now, one of the largest group of Chinese who come to America are people who come to American universities. The number of Chinese who attend Indian universities and IITs is also increasing, despite the fact that they are the rivals. Now, we are the allies. We are the partners. But I don't see many Chinese waking up one day and saying, you know what, after high school, the university I really want to attend is Sindh University or, 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 or the University of Gujranwala or whatever. So what, are, what is going to move on these roads and these railways? Now, I can understand. Uh, military minds thinking that these will be strategically useful because you know military material etc can move very far but then these roads have to pay for themselves how would they now, one example of this is and that was also a mr nawaz sharif project and i criticized it i was in his government and i resigned afterwards because this was one of the things i disagreed with this is his first government 90 he was building this expressway between Islamabad and Lahore. And he was doing it by giving it on a uh, build, operate, and uh, transfer basis uh, to a Korean company. Well, guess what? We were Pakistan. The, the government of Pakistan was the guarantor of the borrowing of Daiwo, the, the, the company that was supposed to be building it. They built it. And I don't know even if today, on an annual basis, the revenue generated from the motorway actually pays the amount that was due to the builder uh, who built it on the BOT basis. So my point is, if the motorway, which is just one chunk between two very important cities and with an entire population in between that needs to move on both services, uh, on things, if that could not start becoming financially viable right up front, how will these highways and railways that are being built between China and Pakistan become economically viable on day one? Now, they may become viable 10 years later. But then we are paying, we are paying for 10 years of the, of, the, of, of the debt servicing. And so are we really getting in sort of deep? And why didn't China 
think of other ways of helping Pakistan? China is not building any university. Pakistan has a serious educational crisis. Pakistan is not building secondary school. Uh, China is not building secondary schools and primary schools. Uh, Pakistan has one of the world's highest out of school populations in the world. Children between the age of five and fifteen. Uh, it's not providing anything for them. China is not running clean drinking water projects to improve health and sanitation. So, how how is China the great friend? And unfortunately, as you know, is often the case in political noise environments. It's not easy to make that case. The argument is. 65, the Americans cut off our assistance. China stood by it. Not that it sent anything or did anything, but it just spoke up for us. And an emotional nation, that's an important thing. 71, they spoke for us. You know, they didn't, um, they may vote against us in the Financial Action Task Force vote, but they still help us block certain things we want to block. So therefore, that creates an aura and a perception that may not necessarily be held up by minute examination. But then sometimes emotion carries more weight than minute examination. Um, may I just add uh, something about the, t the tourism and services aspect? Tourism is thriving in Uzbekistan since three years. Hundred thousands of people are coming, but not a single Chinese tourist is among them. These are all domestic tourists who are using this improved infrastructure. Coming from? Coming up from Punjab, from Karachi, from Sindh. But not from China. Not from China. No, the, the tourism organizations or agencies in Pakistan that are catering for Chinese are catering for Chinese engineers, businessmen, and politicians, and delegations, and, and so on. But not, no individual tourist is coming from, basically, from China. Uh, to the area. But the facilities that are there, the infrastructure facilities are a precondition for the domestic tourism in Pakistan and that brings to an area where after 9-11 the tourism collapsed by 95% after a long time of waiting, some income back into the region and into the area. Another thing when, when China, you were asking for bottom-up uh, support, was when after the uh, 4th of January 2010, there was a, the Atabart uh, big landslide that inundated 25 kilometers of the Karakoram Highway where a lake started. And the northern part of Gilgit Baldistan was cut off from the rest, could after a while only be reached by boat services there, first of all, only by helicopters. And then China stepped in with China Aid and supplied the people with flour, with cooking oil, sugar, salt, and tea. And immediately the reaction in Gilgit by this time was, oh, Chinese wheat is much better than American. And they give us irrespective of uh, a difficult count of what is, what is going on, on here. But that is very much appreciated in, uh, among the people that these things have happened. Afterwards, new tunnels were built, and the road has been rebuilt, and, and uh, that is seen as a, as a very important kind of step uh, in linking this area again with the rest of, of, of Pakistan. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Azra. I'm actually from Gilgit, Pakistan. Um, so my question was for Mr. Haqqani. Um, as you said, like we don't want to be the backyard for other countries to just store their raw material or maybe just transfer it from there. What do you think some of the ways that um, Pakistan can leverage, like what do we have to be independent of um, all of these favors and like that we can leverage that other countries can, uh, US or China can invest in productive um, uh, it build productive institutes um, and, you know, help Pakistan be more, more productive rather than just um, exploit. Well, your question seems to have two different parts. Like, as I also spoke about, so for example, when Gilgit Baltistan was cut off, Chinese flour, etc., came. But that's about Gilgit Baltistan per se. Yeah. And I was talking about sort of CPEC's impact on Pakistan as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, which, 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 which is different. So if your question is, about Gilgit Baltistan particularly, I think that finding a way to resolve the issue of the status of Gilgit Baltistan would be a major step. Because 
because of its linkage with the Kashmir dispute, um, which I fully understand because of the legal issues involved, uh, Pakistan has hesitated to settle that status. That, in effect, makes the people of Gilgit and Baltistan unable to make demands that other provinces of Pakistan can make both on the federal exchequer and on the, uh, on the authorities for many, many things. And so they are kind of, so that needs to be sorted out at, at first. As far as other countries are concerned, well, look, I think Pakistan basically needs to have the, um, the foundations of human cap capital development. It's a nation of 200 million people. 54% are literate. Now, um, in 1947, the geographic area that is today Pakistan had a literacy rate of about 16%, according to one measure. And what is the rest, or what is the Republic of India today or the Union of India today was 18%. There was a 2% difference. They've gone to 78%. Pakistan has gone from 16 to 54. So something's happened here that should not have happened. Female literacy is particularly lagging. So literacy is crucial because if Pakistan has more literate manpower, the economic role of that manpower changes. Just to give you an example, remittances are an important thing in Pakistan. But remittances sent by um, unskilled laborers in, uh, in the Middle East are going to be much smaller, even though they are very reliable, because they always send money to their homes and their families. But the fact of the matter is that if this was literate workforce, things would change. Bangladesh, which has $38 billion worth of exports compared to Pakistan's $22 billion, what are, what are they doing? They don't produce cotton, but the value of Bangladesh's cotton textile exports are greater than Pakistan's. Why? Because they buy cloth from other countries, including Pakistan and India, and turn it into garments. And it's higher value added. A garment can sell, depending on what the brand is, it can sell for much more than just cotton or cotton yarn. So that is a function of skilled and more educated labor. They have a higher literate, literate a higher percentage of literate women in the workforce who can actually stitch. And therefore, they make garments for the international market that meet the international market's requirements. And so, so, so the international community's greatest contribution to Pakistan and Pakistan's own government's greatest decision for itself would be to improve its human development capacity and to improve its uh, human capital so that more people, more women are in the workforce, more people are in the workforce by being capable of doing better quality work and therefore getting better remuneration. And that should be the policy of the United States to the extent it uh, wants to or is able to help Pakistan. That should be the po policy of the European Union. And that should also be the policy of China if it can. Thank you. May I add something to the constitutional status? Because it's always uh, the case that Gilgit Baltistan is mixed with the Kashmir case in a manner that not necessarily should be like this. Uh, at the end of the colonial rule, uh, when it was not decided what will happen with, with, uh, with the Kashmir case, uh, there was a war. And the people of, of Gilgit Baltistan arrested the Kashmiri governor and announced the independent republic of Gilgit on the 1st of November 1947. And they wanted, did not want to be put in one container with Azad Kashmir or with Jammu and Kashmir. They wanted to be independent of that. And that is uh, some of those colonial legacies we have. The, the status was never really defined. And there was this, the nice term was used, Hunza uh, uh, Nagar are under sovereignty of Kashmir. And sovereignty you can interpret in many different ways. Many people in Gilgit Baldistan interpret it as they are not part of the Kashmir problem and the Kashmir crisis. The biggest opponents against the provincial status of Gilgit Baldistan are coming from Pakistan, from Azad Kashmir, because they want Gilgit Baldistan as a uh, weight factor for their cause against the Indian part of, of, of Jammu and Kashmir. Azad 
Jammu and Kashmir is a very small space compared to the whole Kashmir crisis, and Gil of Baldistan gives a nice asset to that. So they are always opposing. Uh, opposing Gil, uh, Benazir Bhutto was ready to uh, to provide a status for Gilgit Baldistan as a province, and it was always uh, uh, squashed by by these kind of. Uh, activities there. And so it is not necessarily so that we have to always think about Gilgit Baldistan as part of, of that uh, central Kashmir crisis. Sir. Um, Carlos Ayon, Bank of Central American Economic Development. Um, I, I'm almost sure that uh, that road's not going to pay itself. And not so much for um, because of the high interest rates, but because um, I've done research for a long time on the subject of economic growth, what causes it, and I couldn't find a correlation with infrastructure anywhere in the world. Um, just to make a point, China, during Xi Jinping, they have invested more in infrastructure and the rate of economic growth has decelerated to 7% while they were not giving much importance. Let's say the 1990s, the rate of growth was 11% annually. Um, GDP um, for the U.S. that they invested during the Roosevelt administration record amounts uh, as a share of GDP on infrastructure in the 1930s was actually the slowest growing decade in the whole 200 plus history of the U.S. But um, with respect to what the ambassador said uh, with um, education, I also couldn't find correlation with education and growth um, to make a point. Um, the U.S., um, many economic historians consider the U.S. attain its fastest rates of economic growth ever in the late 19th century, 1880s, 1890s, at a time when like 1% of the U.S. population 25 years or older had a university education. Nowadays, it's like 45%. And nowadays, the last 10 years, the U.S. has grown by about 2% annually. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also, for you, um, I presume you're German. Uh, Germany in the late 19th century, 1880s, 1890s, grew by about nine, uh, six percent annually. Uh, its best performance in the 19th century, while female participation in the labor force was almost non-existent, while education levels, from all perspective, quantitative or qualitative, were a tiny fraction of what they are today. And today, Germany is growing under Angela Merkel has grown by two percent annually which is fast compared to other European countries who've grown even slower. So there is no correlation, historically speaking, between infrastructure and growth and education and growth either, or gender participation and growth. Uh, so I'm not going to enter into an argument I've learned in my 62 years, uh, not that the first four years or five years of my life I was arguing with economists, <laughs> but I've learned never to argue with an economist. But I never use the phrase that it will contribute to economic growth. I only said that the qualitative, for example, I was speaking in context of exports, and I was talking in terms of human capital, that Pakistan has, and I just cited education as one of the factors in not having the human capital that can produce uh, the kind of uh, economy that has slightly higher exports than it does. That was the thing. So I didn't mean to suggest that there is a correlation. And even on the question of the infrastructure, I didn't get into the business of there being any correlation between infrastructure uh, or not being correlation. I just didn't get into the subject of, a, uh, of, of the correlation. Shift. I think you're up to something because you're pretty much what you were suggesting, there is no correlation with infrastructure and growth. And I think you're on to something correct on that historically. But if you're suggesting, as a lot of social scientists and economists uh, I'm, do, I'm not between education them. and growth, there's also no correlation there. Thank you. Thank you. One thing that we are seeing, although there aren't very many facts, is that you know, I have colleagues from Sindh and from Karachi who their families are involved in a variety of different businesses, but now they're feeling a lot of pressure from the dumping of Chinese-made goods uh, in these cities. Um, and so infrastructure does actually bring something, and oftentimes it actually disincentivizes. And, and we're not talking about growth per se. I mean, I don't think economic growth is the subject of what we are talking about. We're just talking about the various anecdotal factors here, although your point is well taken about Social that. uplift and federal stabilization, which arguably has always been the dream and what 200 million people in Pakistan deserve, 
is getting farther and farther away if you, I th when you look at what's actually happening in Pakistan. Right. That's my perspective. May I add a little bit? Yeah. Um, there, there are some puzzles connected with these kind of investments that are taking place at the moment. There were two special economic zones uh, implemented in Kashgar as the, as the Central Asian hub. One was supported by Shenzhen and one was supported by Guangdong. And uh, many Pakistani businessmen were invited to participate in, in, in these kind of activities. But uh, last year we talked to s several and they said, we cannot afford to be here because nothing is taking place here. There's no business at all. All these warehouses are empty. And there is an investment in, in a future where many people don't know what kind of future is envis envisaged in, in, in this kind of context. Where is this business coming from? And one thing I can tell you is uh, the exchange of goods is very one-sided. <laughs> and it is a huge export of Chinese goods, but not that much of import of Pakistani goods that is coming along this highway. So we have time for one final question. Yeah. Bill Deal, I'm President Emeritus of the U.S. Kazakhstan Business Association, and I have a question about the uh, Pakistani military, uh, which has had uh, a lot of uh, play in the uh, Pakistani economy. And I'm wondering if uh, the, any you see any incentives that have been uh, seized by the Pakistani military from uh, this uh, investment. Are there, are there is there bait for them in a sense in this? Is there uh, some areas where they're likely to be uh, uh, getting uh, paid in, in this or uh, reaping uh, benefits from investments. Uh, Professor Kreutzmann, you may have just answered this question, yeah. certainly empty warehouses, but I'm just wondering if this angle has been looked at. No, it is, it, it's a very important question. When the initial Karakorn Highway was built, it, it, it was a military affair, basically, to, to do this and set up this road. And uh, when it was uh, implemented in, by 1978, a so-called civil wing of the uh, Pakistan army was founded, the Frontier Works Organization, what, which was responsible for the maintenance of this road. And uh, the Frontier Works Organization is one of the biggest road builders in Pakistan. So the, the army is, is quite uh, having a share in, in, in road building and infrastructure development as a private entrepreneur, so to speak. And so they are very much involved in, in, in the whole link road business that is connecting to this uh, Karakoram Highway. But the single most important infrastructure is the Karakoram Highway, and that accounts for 40% of all roads in, in Gilgit, Pakistan. So it is, it is one big affair, but the Frontier Works Organization is the big player in that, and not private enterprises. Say final word? I really don't have a final word, except that uh, I think that from Pakistan's point of view, I think Pakistan gains from China's investments and uh, involvement with Pakistan's economy, but it needs to review what the terms of the, that engagement should be. It needs to diversify. It needs to stop thinking in terms of linking economic and strategic decisions. That's what happened with the United States. I mean, there was a time when, because we were part of Southeast Asia Treaty Organization and Central Treaty Organization, etc., uh, every beverage conceivable, uh, Pakistan's a hot country, as you know, uh, American beverage maker ended up creating a bottling facility in Pakistan. So you could have drinks that no one in America was drinking at that time. I don't know if anybody ever remembers something called Hoffman Orange. And, 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 and even that was being sold in Pakistan at that time. And that has not really been good for Pakistan. And so de-link the strategic from the economic. Uh, think in terms of economic benefit much more clearly. Have a much more transparent system of discussion over issues. Stop thinking of critics as enemies and actually listen to them because that is sometimes useful. And, uh, and deepen your partnership and friendship with China, but don't assume that the only predators in the world are going to be Europeans or Americans. China could be an, a predator as much as the Europeans and the Americans were. 
And if Pakistan can break out of it, pay more attention to the people, the Baluch, the people of Gilgit Baltistan, the people, the small manufacturers and artisans of Sindh, uh, the people of Punjab and Pashtun Kha, they deserve a little more hearing instead of a small corporatist state sort of thinking. I mean, the, the fact that Gilgit Baltistan had a legislative assembly that had to be kind of deprived of the term legislative uh, doesn't speak too well. You need to include people more rather than exclude them. And excluding them because you have some agreements with a power that you consider to be your future strategic protector uh, and do it at the expense of your own people, uh, putting people in prison because they criticized an economic project, which you say is an economic project. So an economic project, there's no big deal. I mean, you know, there's a building going across. There'll be 100 people here who will say that building shouldn't be built there. Trees should be planted there. That's what economic discussions should be like. But to make it into such a big life and death issue that anybody who criticizes CPEC then is painted as an enemy of Pakistan, that, I think, is a course that Pakistan can avoid. And those who back that course need to review their thinking. To save the republic, I would say that's absolutely correct. Thank you very much for coming. Professor Kreutzmann, thank you very much. And Ambassador Akhani, thank you for your insights today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.